I'd like to introduce Tessa Kelly. Tessa is our third artist in residence in IS183's residency partnership with the Red Lion Inn. Artists are invited each summer to further develop their craft while exploring and highlighting the history, culture, and architecture of the Red Lion Inn. Tessa is an architect and she'll be discussing the residency in the context of her other three projects this summer. So thank you all for joining us tonight and I'll turn things over to Tessa. So hi, thank you, Lucy. Thanks a lot for um, inviting me to do this and for inviting me to think about um, what it means for me to call myself an artist. Um, as Lucy mentioned, I'm an architect and um, this residency and also preparing for this talk have been um, kind of an eye-opening process for me to think a little bit about what the line is between art and architecture in my work and um, whether it's useful to think about there being a separation between those things or whether um, for my practice it's most useful to just think about the way I practice architecture as involving some public art um, and uh, sort of fine art drawing techniques. So those are some of the themes that I'm, I think, going to grapple with tonight. I'm going to show um, three different sets of work. The first will be uh, drawings that I've produced over the past month at the Red Lion Inn as part of the joint residency program with IS183. Um, some of you who know me may know that I live in Pittsfield, so I'm the re the residency doesn't imply that I am actually staying or living at the Red Lion Inn. It's more um, I've been using it as sort of a weekly uh, break from the regular routine to go and do some hand drawing, um, and so just a little more context about me and my life. Um, my husband and I run an architecture practice together, which is called Arcade. Um, and we have two kids, a four-year-old and a one-year-old. And as all parents, I think, are experiencing this summer, um, the lack of childcare makes uh, the question of how we work um, a totally new experience than it has ever been in the past. So how I work as a parent and how I've been kind of managing this residency as a parent has been a big part of the kind of work that I've produced. So um, what I kind of decided early on was that each time I would go to the inn, I would bring my four-year-old daughter Eve with me because um, maybe some people have this down, but for us, it's still very overwhelming for one parent to be alone with both kids. So to take off somewhere, we kind of always each have to have one of the kids with us. So Eve has been along with me each of the um, sessions at the Red Lion. And beca partly because of that, um, I realized fairly early on that it just wouldn't be possible to do long duration indoor drawings um, because she would be by my side. So one of the first decisions that I made was that I would focus exclusively on the outdoor spaces around the Red Lion Inn. Um, and the drawings I'm going to show you tonight focus on two um, adjacent courtyards, which are on either side of the historic pool house, which is now used as the laundry room. Um, so the two drawings that you see on your screen now are from our first day um, at the residency. Uh, on the left, you'll see kind of a, a line drawing of um, one of the kind of interstitial spaces between the laundry room, which then serves towels out to the pool area. Um, on the right hand side, you'll see kind of a warming box that I think has trays in it to serve the outdoor cafe. So one of the things about looking at these outdoor spaces at the inn is I think traditionally the Red Lion Inn has been um, 
my, very inward focused, at least until this summer, all the times I had ever been at the Red Lion Inn had been on the porch, in the dining room, in the libraries, in the rooms themselves, in the kind of lobby area. So um, the outdoor spaces kind of are this back of house, uh, have this back of house quality where um, it was actually kind of dynamic and exciting to, to look at you know, sort of the behind the scenes operations of where the staff are coming and going out of the side of the inn. Um, and so I, I was interested in looking at some of these more infrastructural components. And I think what these drawings show um, is generally an interest that I have in using the process of drawing by hand um, to kind of categorize things or to um, zoom in on one specific type of object or material of object or color of object and to exclusively draw that, um, kind of erasing everything else in the context as a way to create kind of a layered system of looking at what's around us. And I don't know if that, that interest partly comes from um, vegan architect where uh, a lot of the work we do is a process of layering quite literally before computers, the way architects would create a set of drawings is with layers and layers of trace paper, one layer would have just the doors, the next layer would have just the walls, the next layer would have um, the bushes around the outside, the next layer would have the stairs, so that if you needed to change or update one of those components, um, you could simply take out that layer of trace um, and leave everything else in place. So um, the two drawings that you see up right now, um, this was the third day at the inn. Eve was swimming and I was doing a series of um, drawings, just essentially looking around the pool courtyard and zooming in on uh, types of materials and types of objects that I saw. Um, so from built elements, from metallic elements to, um, you know, landscape elements to the water itself. Um, on the left, I had this sort of orangish rose uh, pastel with me. Um, so I just was looking around seeing what little fragments around me were of that color and putting those on paper. On the right, um, similarly, in a dark blue drawing some um, hooks for pool equipment on the left and then some other kind of miscellaneous objects. Um, this set of drawings on the left shows the pool cover and some other blue components and on the right is kind of a trace of the outline of the roof of the pool house. Um, and finally, the, this is, I think, was the fourth day. So the first three uh, days of drawings that I just showed you, um, those were by necessity something like two minute drawings. And that's based on the attention span of having a four year old next to me. Um, and, you know, just making quick observations of my surroundings and trying to um, both create interesting compositions on the page, but also um, look around and see what kinds of categories my eye could create both through color and material. So those were very quick drawings. These two drawings were the one time that I've been without Eve with me. Um, and these were a couple of watercolors where I sat down in the, um, kind of passageway into the linen closet. And on the left was doing a, a kind of shadow study of the crumpled ends of the uh, laundry bags as they got thrown out of the inn into this kind of waiting zone before things moved into the laundry room. And then on the right um, is the shelving system where the bath mats and all the different size sheets and all this sort of thing were lining up. So what I was exploring over there was um, 
kind of creating an underlying grid of the metal framework that holds this stuff and then kind of trying to create more of a cloud-like feel for the actual linens that were on the shelves. So um, those were the drawings that have happened. So a selection of the drawings that have happened so far at the Red Lion Inn. And um, the next project that I wanna show you, um, the next two projects that I'm going to show you are, um, are architecture projects, but architecture projects that have, um, have kind of an unusual setup about them, um, both through the way that they are funded and also through the way that um, my role in particular as the architect for these two projects in partnership with Chris, um, how my role as the architect kind of expands and morphs as part of contributing to the ongoing energy of the life of these works. So this project right here is called The Mastheads. And um, it is, I think, just really at this intersection of art and architecture. Um, the Mastheads are five small spaces which are meant to be used for writing in the city of Pittsfield. And they simultaneously um, are meant to call attention to Pittsfield's literary heritage, um, the, the roof form and window positioning on each one reflects a structure where um, during the American Renaissance, uh, five authors wrote while they were in Pittsfield being Melville, Hawthorne, Thoreau, Oliver, Wendell Holmes, and Longfellow. Um, so the initial purpose of this project was to think about how architecture and an architect could act in a much more nimble way than uh, traditionally an architect is required to work. So um, unlike being an artist in some ways, architects usually need to have clients on board with a vision or coming to them with a vision and paying for a vision, um, which the architect then, you know, works with and accommodates. There's a different kind of track of project that I'm really excited about and interested in, which is um, how architects themselves can create a more direct relationship with um, opportunities and problems that we see in the public sphere without that kind of intermediate of needing a client to come to you with the idea first. Um, so this project was actually funded by the National Endowment for the Arts um, through their Our Town grant program. Um, and so these five writing studios we use to host a July writer's residency and we also use to um, work with Pittsfield Public School kids um, and do community programming to use writing and Pittsfield's literary legacy as one tool um, through which to kind of uplift uh, residents perceptions of Pittsfield and also opportunities to engage with um, Pittsfield's history. Um, so these images so far are what the mastheads used to look like and how they used to operate. Um, this summer we couldn't have our writers and residents come to Pittsfield so the question of what the mastheads would mean and how it would operate this year um, that was sort of just a new uh, project to think about. And I think in some ways a very healthy project to think about, which, um, you know, put us a bit more on our toes. This is our fourth year of operating the Mastheads and kind of invited us to um, think about what we'd been doing that was working, how it could translate uh, into still impacting public space and, one of the things that I learned this year through working on the mastheads and kind of 
shaping what the design component of the mastheads would be this year um, is that um, I am really excited about ways that as an architect, um, I can work with very inexpensive and quick turnaround types of interventions on public spaces. Um, and really where that's coming from is, um, it's almost like a, 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 a desire to prototype or test out ways that people engage with or experience unusual alterations to their everyday habits or systems. So these two images that you see on the screen, I don't know if people can see my cursor, um, but what we did this year is we still selected and supported five writers in residence, um, but since they were not physically in Pittsfield, we uh, paired each of their work with an essential business in Pittsfield, which were grocery stores and hardware stores and installed excerpts of their text throughout that store as a way to um, kind of just make people uh, curious about the process of moving through the city and help people to kind of engage with familiar spaces in new ways. Um, so on the left, you'll see one of our writers, Kendra Allen. She was paired with Guidos um, and we kind of, uh, drew from Guido's their little black laminated cheese signs and created 43, I think, um, little excerpts of her text, which were sprinkled throughout the whole store. This one says, but we are the shared room now. We are the everything. Um, and the, the idea is that they're just tucked in throughout the normal stuff and that um, people come across them and become curious and become more engaged with close looking of, uh, of their surroundings. And then the one on the right, um, another one of the writers, we had Mi Tran. Uh, <clears throat> her installation um, I did at Elm Street Hardware and kind of in each space, the methodology was to kind of go in there and look at, um, you know, what opportunities presented themselves in terms of how they were already presenting text and how um, we could engage with that. So here they had these kind of standard 12 by 12 linoleum floor tiles. So um, on a sort of no slip floor surfacing, we printed um, lines of her text throughout the store. This one says things that simply jump at you and it's installed next to a um, <clears throat> shelf of coiled garden hoses um, on the left. And again, you'll see these are not glamorous spaces. These are just everyday kind of normal Pittsfield spaces. And to me, that's part of the joy of the Mastheads is that um, it really is just fundamentally a project that doesn't rely on uh, being in one of, you know, the eight mega US cities where there are concentrations of philanthropists and donors. It's really, to me, an ongoing and very healthy experiment for how designers can um, uplift the most familiar of scenes um, through different kinds of interventions that just wake people up in as in in public spaces so this one on the left this is at the stairwell at car hardware in pittsfield um it says the bread pure texture the knife pure control i lamented privately that i was done cutting it Tyler was stirring the soup that I had been asked to provide. I brought that, I said. Nice, he said. Yeah, I said. Then to Michael, I just have to figure out what I want. It's not in the books, Michael said. Yeah, I said. Then I added, maybe not for you. And then over on the right, you'll see um, Harry's Supermarket, which is one of the last um, very... Um, overtly family-owned grocery stores in the area. And the reason that I say overtly is that 
um, there's this one brother, Bob Nichols, who's one of the butchers who still draws or, or uses this kind of traditional storefront lettering script every week to update the signs and specials in the front window. So um, this one, the others I just, ha I, I personally just laid out and got printed and installed myself. This one was kind of a uh, collaboration with Bob in the sense that I brought him the black paper and three big white markers and said, um, you know, here are the lines of text. And he sort of took it from there and I love how these um, posters at the bottom here, the marshmallow of love and the marshmallow of more sleep um, are lined up with uh, pepper and onion beef patties and beer can chicken thighs. So really the purpose of this work is um, to find people where they are and to, um, to give little gifts to people who live in the city of Pittsfield um, that make them feel a sense of pride about um, where they live and create a sense of opportunity and hope. So these billboards um, combined lines of text from three different uh, subgroups who the Mastheads kind of works with. Uh, the, the top line um, in each example comes from one of our elementary school poets who um, the Mastheads works with during the school year. We provide uh, poetry programming in two of Pittsfield's elementary schools. So the first line always comes from one of our second through fifth grade poets. The second line comes from a famous Berkshire author. And the last line comes from one of our 2020 writers in residence, each around um, one word at the top, which is kind of a unifying theme. So the one on the left, Scale, I'm big but I'm small. Wouldn't you like a drop of something to pick you up? I never get caught. And then on the right, sight. My house is a small one in Pittsfield. I was born by a golden river in the shadow of two great hills. Expect nothing to jump here. And then structure. My dad gave me my name. I at length encased myself completely in boards. I thought I was the statue. Memory. I went for a short ride and then it turned into a long ride. Our hair has grown white together. The street light is a burning man. Sound. Music and eating and dancing and snoring and yelling. Talk no more about your stories but begin. These are techniques you are learning. And then the last one, color. Blue is inside of my body, blacker than a hundred midnights, the marshmallow of stay with me. Um, and then these are kind of uh, ragged looking images. These are uh, inserts that we produce and distribute in the Berkshire Eagle. So again, one of the things that we're honing in on with the Mastheads is finding the uh, media that the most average Pittsfield citizen is engaging with and to deliver our work through those media. Um, so the Berkshire Eagle on Sundays reaches 30,000 doorsteps. Um, so we, this is one of the primary ways that we share the work of our writers and residents each year. So um, the design of this issue was to kind of physically place the text of each of the writers into one of the five studios since they were not um, actually able to be here in person this year, still trying to create that connection between each of them and one of the spaces. Um, and then this one is sort of an inverse negative of that where um, the final work produced by the writers is in each of their studio outlines and then the cross grain is a series of three essays um, by members of our internal Mastheads team. And the last project that I am going to talk about is the Westside Riverway Park. Um, this one, uh, we also applied to the National Endowment for the Arts and received a grant from the same program that supported the launch of the Mastheads, which is a program called Our Town. Um, and 
the reason that we did that is that um, this project um, was could have been um, sort of a problematic one from its inception in the sense that um, this new park was going to be inserted into a neighborhood where there was a lot of resident demand for a different use of this land um, for a community center instead of a park. Um, and, you know, one of the, so we used the grant from the NEA um, to support essentially two years, the first of which was before construction and the second of which was kind of during construction, two years of close um, community engagement to figure out how to make this space something that people cared about and something want, something that they wanted, um, and then how to work through each component of the design so that um, the space would be owned by the neighborhood. So um, we ran uh, at least a dozen sessions with um, different groups of Westside residents. Our first was with 50 kids at the uh, Maryland Hamilton Sports and Literacy Summer Camp, where we had kids from the ages of kindergarten through 18 build architectural models of their dream pavilions, park pavilions. Um, we did sessions with the Westside Women's Group, uh, each asking each person to design um, what they would like to see as a West Side walking loop to start thinking about how um, people from other parts of Pittsfield would move toward this new space and uh, use this new space. Um, and the most powerful thing that we wound up doing is to partner closely with a neighborhood group called the West Side Legends. And um, I think why this outreach was as successful as it was, was that um, the West Side Legends, well, firstly, um, in, in conversations with their board, um, we kind of came to a point where we were able to find a kind of a rough outline identity for what this park could provide for the neighborhood directly across the river, um, just on the other side of the block. There's already um, a park called Durant Park, which is um, very integral to the spirit of the neighborhood. And um, it has a basketball court, it has a playground, there's an annual um, NAACP gathering festival there. So one of the initial concerns was um, not wanting to create a dynamic where there were two parks competing against each other for a similar kind of space in the neighborhood psyche. So um, this park, we decided to design around the concept of a space for arts and culture block parties. So the question of block parties and the interest in block parties came out in one of our very early sessions with the West Side Women's Circle as one of the community events that people missed the most. Um, so in the year leading up to construction of the park, we had events in the park itself before there was physically anything there to test out essentially layouts for how the park could work um, with a performance pavilion, which you see at the upper left, a stand-in in this image is just kind of a pop-up tent. Um, access to the river. This is the first kind of recreational river park in this part of the neighborhood. Um, and so we partnered with the Berkshire Environmental Action Team and the Housatonic Valley Association to bring boats to these events and get kids in the water. Um, and then you'll see on the right kind of a flexible space for, for group gatherings. Um, so this park is under construction now. Um, these are some images of a long pavilion which starts at the sidewalk 
and leads people directly down to the river. So it creates this kind of enclosed pathway to bring you from the sidewalk down to an encounter with the river. And along the way, as you move under it, there will be a series of different um, programmatic uses suggested. So the first thing that you'll see when you, once the park, once the pavilion's complete, is you'll pass through a series of benches that direct themselves toward the public stage. So the stage can be, um, the stage can be engaged with either from the lawn or for smaller talks or church gatherings or different things from the benches under the pavilion. And then if you continue on, um, the more rectilinear benches, which are made of granite, um, kind of transform into these more naturalistic shapes as you get toward the river's edge and at the canoe launch. Um, and then you'll see on the right that the, the lawn component um, we activated with a series of these uh, undulating steel edges. So these are shown um, just when they're first being laid out. Um, but ultimately what will happen is behind each of these uh, outlines, um, there will be a transition from mowed grass to tall wildflowers or mowed grass to landscape mounds where people can sit and look back at the pavilion. Um, so that's actually the last image that I have. I don't know if I, um, I don't know how I did on time, but uh, I would love to talk and hear any questions or comments. You're great on time, Tessa. It's 6.33, so we have a little less than a half hour for questions and discussion. Um, does anyone have, there's, there's nothing in the chat so far unless they send it to you directly. Um, so you're all welcome to unmute and join a discussion. <laughs> and I can kick off with one. Um, I'm really curious to hear how your, your experience, like what I'm seeing in, um, in your work in these other two projects is that you're really manipulating the space for people to interact with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm noticing some similarities between, your, between that idea and your work at the Red Lion Inn. Can you speak to that at all? Like how you're seeing how space manipulates how people behave in it? Yeah, um, let's see. You know, it's kind of interesting because um, there are kind of, I guess in the, in the design, in my own design mind, there are kind of two categories of work that I do that I feel are actually somewhat, um, separate from each other and, and that I design separately, but that then interact with each other, which is kind of the more abstracted, um, I guess formal, uh, work of just what the shapes are and the forms are and the colors are and the materials are. And then I also think about design as the process of shaping and planning and setting up the conditions for the actual programming that will take place within that space. Um, and I think I actually kind of keep those things separate a little bit in my mind. One of the things that I really don't believe, I don't believe that um, design by committee works. And I don't believe that, um, uh, I, I think that the architect needs to remain the voice to make these projects formally powerful. Um, but what I've found as the best way to really engage a public is to co-design the programming that will bring those spaces to life. So that's not to say that um, I would, you know, fully design something and then ask for community engagement to program it, but that the, the theme of the community conversations through the design process, the questions are more, how do you want to gather in this space? How many people do you want to gather in this space? What kinds of um, literary engagement does your school need? Asking those kinds of use-based questions um, then kind of informs the design as opposed to saying, okay, group of 50 people, um, 
what sh what shape pavilion do we want? Um, so I think it's really important for the architect to figure out meaningful ways to ask for input, but to also be sure that um, there is space saved for the architect to really, you know, create a compelling design because ultimately um, that's what makes these projects unique, I think. And I think that's what makes them exciting. Um, there are so many parks in Pittsfield where the pavilion is literally ordered from a catalog of park pavilions. Um, and that's not to say that wonderful things don't happen in those parks, but I think that particularly in a city like Pittsfield where um, a lot of people have a very negative perception about the city and where it is to create something that's one of a kind and is only for this city and is a direct response to the needs of a given site or story in Pittsfield, um, I think is really essential. So how it connects to the Red Lion Inn is, um, I think at the Red Lion, at least the drawings I've been doing so far have been more in the first category where I actually haven't been um, trying yet to represent people's use of the space. I've been more just looking in an abstracted way at, um, you know, some of the underlying um, graphics, shapes, uh, forms, materials that I'm perceiving in the space. And I think there is an interesting relationship set up. Um, and I don't know how I, I will explore this through drawings or whether it would have to be through writing, but between these two spaces that I'm looking at, the this building is kind of the crux of the people who are lounging by the pool, the the guests, and then the people who are working in the laundry area, um, and how they move in and out of those spaces in different ways, and then these particular overlaps that they have, like the room where the clean towels come out and the dirty towels go in. Um, so, you know, it's possible that a series of more diagrammatic drawings that try to convey um, movement through space could be an interesting next step, but I feel like so far I haven't really mm -hmm. tried to represent the use of the spaces. So interesting. Does anyone else have questions? It looks like Kara has typed in a question. She says, I'm so excited about ways that architecture can exist without traditional clients, but in that there is a deeper form of humanity and collectivity possible. Have you thought about other types of spaces or project types that need a new funding model? Um, it's, I mean, in my mind, I wish, It's so hard as I think an architect or a designer or an artist or any creative person or maybe any person in general to figure out the line between um, wanting to control things for control's sake and, uh, and uh, genuinely it being the fact that, um, you know, someone other than the donor maybe has a different and more applicable relationship to kind of driving the project. Um, I think that in some ways, I, I wish every architecture project had a totally different funding model. I wish that, um, you know, something that's been amazing about working with the city of Pittsfield, both on the mastheads and with this park, is that um, the concept of client is, at least with the folks that we've engaged with in the city is very different than, um, it's a much more dispersed concept of what a client means. There's not sort of one person within the city saying, um, I really want you to change this or that, or this isn't my style, or it's kind of uh, more, are you serving a public and are you solving a problem? And if you're doing those things, then, you can you can do those things sort of as you see fit. Um, and I think a lot of times it's just very, very hard for architects to ever execute um, 
a vision because there are so many uh roadblocks along the way, both in terms of where the money is coming from, but also in terms of just, you know, you have to work with real products that you can find on the market and that limits things. And you have to coordinate a series of, you know, 20 people to come together to execute any one vision. So it's very different in that sense from, you know, some of the mastheads installations that I showed from this summer or the work at the Red Lion Inn where the relationship between the creator and the product is just direct. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. Whereas, um, you know, I hope that by the time I'm 70, I will have kind of mastered how to make it through this amorphous middle zone from having a vision to actually having a product come out the other end that you feel really good about. But, um, these two Pittsfield projects, I think, are the closest that we've gotten to that. Um, but it's just so challenging as an architect to um, almost always feel like you're losing control of the process as it goes. And um, there are just so many painful moments of... Um, and again, I think in some ways this just speaks to all of life, but I, I, now that I've seen these two other projects actually operate in a different way, I believe that there is another path. Um, and so I think in some ways public funding and um, enlightened public clients are what I feel especially excited about right now. You know, throughout your residency, I really enjoyed talking to you about the duality that, that you're experiencing between being artist and architect and how those like titles feel to you. Mm -hmm. you Want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you know, it's very funny. Um, part of the reason that I wanted to become an architect is that I have always wanted to be a creator, but I, I, <laughs> I felt like if I could have an official title that was on a license that said, I am this, then I could in confidence say that I was that thing. And I find it very hard to say that I'm an artist. And I feel like I don't know, it makes me question like how anyone is brave enough to call themselves an artist because somehow I just, um, using that word to describe myself just feels like I'm um, cheating or I, I don't know what it is. I don't know why I feel that way, but it just feels like I don't know how to earn the mantle of calling oneself an artist. Um, whereas saying that I'm an architect just feels very straightforward. Um, but I do think that there's a space that I want to continue developing and that I actually really am grateful for the opportunity to put this talk together because it made me realize that these more kind of ephemeral public art type projects to me are really um, an essential ingredient to practicing architecture, both when they uh, activate spaces that I myself have created or designed, but also if they have nothing to do at all with a building or space that I've designed, just as a way to um, test out and learn how um, to make people's experience of being in space more exciting. Um, and I think ultimately that's one of the jobs of architecture. And I think that you know, working through this art lens of doing these text installations um, has been in some ways kind of a precursor to what might later become architecture projects. For instance, another, uh, another initiative that we've been discussing a lot with some of our partners in the West Side is this question of the West Side walking loop. And if there were some sort of, um, you know, designated walking loop in the West Side, whether it be for exercise or kids getting safely to school or people connecting from downtown Pittsfield to the park. Um, 
how would that pathway be expressed? And we've been thinking a lot about kinds of text that may be able to move people through space, whether it's um, lines of poetry written by kids in the neighborhood or um, interesting fragments of history that pertain to the neighborhood. Um, and I think, you know, in some ways, this other medium of text, and I think it's because the Mastheads just is this architecture and poetry project, it's introduced to me text as a way to, um, to create very direct meaning for art that in some ways I think a lot of contemporary art is only discernible to people who have a certain kind of artistic training or artistic education. Not to say that it doesn't have a visceral impact on anyone who sees it, but I think that there can be kind of an alienating sense of confusion um, to see something that you don't understand its purpose, but in using text, it's such a, um, it's just such a universal uh, medium that everyone has kind of an emotional response to something that they read. Um, and that kind of overlay, I think, of text and space is something that, um, thanks to the Mastheads, I think that I will just continue to explore and see um, how, you know, whether text can actually play more of a role in architecture, and, and if so, how, or whether text is kind of an inherently alternate and separate means of uh, kind of conveying emotion than space, um, or how they might work together. Um, but, yeah. Uh, we have a question from Michelle, and then from Travis. Hi, Tessa. Um, I'm Michelle. I, um, I really resonate with your comment about not feeling like you have the authority to call yourself an artist because uh, maybe it's because I'm an engineer, which I think sometimes has some parallels to, uh -huh. to architecture. Um, so I really resonated with that. But I was wondering, you know, with your residency at um, Red Lion Inn, which kind of feels to me like at least so far in your process has been more kind of like documentation based observational like mm -hmm. more like categorizing your surroundings um and i was curious to know like cause you kind of touched on it i think earlier but how how does that how does that um how do you balance that against these projects where you do have a more direct line to like the end product. And do you see those two things, like you see value still in those two things working together in your career or are you like gravitating more towards one or the other? Um, I mean, I think the most exciting possibility is to continue weaving these things together. What always feels impossible is figuring out how and from where the next client or paid opportunity is going to come that will allow me or us to do these two things at the same time because even the city of Pittsfield I think they would love for every public project to have this robust of a community engagement um, component but in order to make that happen for the park we had to find the funding ourselves to do it um, and, you know, in some ways, I've just completely embraced the role of grant writer as part of being an architect in a disinvested city because um, the only way to make these projects meaningful and powerful and to put, to, to create architecture that's of value in a city where there's not a lot of available funding is to figure out ways to bring in more funding. We, we just, we need to be able to expand these design projects um, into projects that that um, invite residents to to talk about bigger questions, and then have the freedom to figure out how these projects can even segue into next projects or next steps based on what we hear from the community. And I think without um, that kind of grant writing component to this work. 
um, the, the community engagement opportunities are just so truncated um, that you can't create that kind of meaningful dialogue around design. Um, and I think that, you know, architecture is such a powerful way of impacting people's perceptions of the place they live because it physically alters the space of their neighborhood and the spaces, you know, that of, of their city. Um, and, you know, if that can happen in a real dialogue that's based on what people are, can tell you that they need and what people are working on and what people are thinking about, um, then I think those kinds of projects can really start to transform the psyche of not only cities, but even neighborhoods like the West Side neighborhood where, um, you know, I think this was a totally different kind of engagement with a city project than has ever been experienced by West Side residents. Um, and, you know, on the question of the Red Lion Inn and how that, how those drawings might expand into something more meaningful, I think until tonight, I had kind of just been thinking of that project as a way to, um, you know, just create drawings that were maybe even sort of just meditative in their purpose or that didn't really have a larger social purpose, but, um, the more I've been thinking about it and talking about it with Lucy, I do think there could be sort of an interesting opportunity in that project to um, <clears throat> blow up some of those drawings to bigger scale and uh, install them over plywood on kind of vine with, with um, these matte vinyl stickers that we use a lot and that I showed in some of those mastheads projects and use them in some ways to activate these two courtyards that I talked about. Um, they're currently just, I think, feel like very back of house spaces, but particularly now, I think due to COVID, there's a lot of interest in kind of recapturing um, outdoor spaces as places of enjoyment. Um, so I think, you know, there might be some lasting way that some of these drawings could impact the experience of those spaces and whether um, that remains kind of just a, you know, like a graphic formal experience or whether there's some bigger project that that can weave into, I don't yet know the answer, but I do like the concept of thinking about for the second half of the residency, how the work um, that's done there can have some kind of um, bigger purpose that either touches more of the guests or touches the workers or both of those things or creates a new space for outdoor engagement at the inn. That's awesome. Thank you for that response. Um, I just feel like it's really interesting to hear an architect talk about um, like their work as a medium through which like ownership can get be given back to like the people that live in a space mm -hmm. um it's just really cool but really really great perspective to hear so thank you yeah i think we have a question from travis yeah hey tessa thank you so much for this work and this presentation um it's really super exciting i i, I love it and uh I, I love seeing that it's affecting things like you know walkways and billboards but then like grounded projects and all of these different dimensions it's um i i would i wondered first i, I have like two questions it's kind of a two-part question just what is the space that you were uh that, that you kind of showed two images uh at the end of your slides that were outdoor spaces where people were gathering and working on larger projects um in the landscape um and um places where people gather and do activities. What are those? I didn't quite catch where they are in the city. Is this, can you still see my screen? Uh, yes. Is Wait. it the images that I have up right here? Yeah, the, the, uh, this field and these people in microphones. Yeah, and then, so this is actually the field that is currently being transformed into the new park. So this okay. was in a, this was a series of events that we had in that field when it was just kind of an open lawn when they were preparing for construction to start. Um, okay. So we kind of prototyped different layouts 
um, for a park design on the blank slate of the lawn so that people could feel and kind of anticipate before construction started how they would be able to use the space uh, once it was done. So that was kind of the concept of hosting these events there before construction started. Nice. And where is that exactly? I it is, yep. Yeah. So it's in Pittsfield and it's at the intersection of um, Bradford Street and Dewey Ave. So if you are on North Street, um, the corner where Methuselah is, mm -hmm. that is uh, mm -hmm. Bradford Street. Okay. If you so went you down the there street. and you just kept going straight essentially until you hit the river, uh, Dewey Ave is parallel to the river. Uh, you just right. go straight down Bradford Street and then the park is directly in front of you. Okay, nice. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so do you, I guess that was my, my leading to my next question, which is, um, do you have plans to uh, continue engagement with Mastheads and your work at that site? Yeah, um, that's and, almost and, like a, a setup question. That's a perfect question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in the sense, go ahead. Well, so, because, like, I'm, my sort of, like, inspiration about the whole, um, in, you know, community engagement uh, message, you know, that you're, that you're bringing is uh, to have outdoor space that is frequented and uh, interactive with representatives of your team mm -hmm. to, you know, have an ongoing conversation that can you know uh, either be by message box or just by people hanging out in a space at a regular time yeah or you know i don't know what but like you know i don't know if this is i don't know if other architects feel this way but hmm. i feel so much um commitment to the ongoing life of hmm. any project that we design i i <laughs> i just am drawn to and driven to remain engaged with the programming that happens here and how people use the space. And um, to me, that remains a very exciting part of the design process, even after the construction is done, um, just remaining engaged with how the space is used. So um, to the question of you know, the mastheads in the West Side Riverway Park coming into conversation with each other. Um, we, I mentioned that this was our fourth season of running the mastheads. And in our first couple of years, um, it kind of took us some time to figure out who our audience was. Um, you know, we, there is, a lot of cultural programming in the Berkshires that a specific subset of people is comfortable taking advantage of. And in the most blunt terms, I would say those are well-educated, um, older white people. And, you know, in our first couple of years, we were, even though we, even though the ambition of the mastheads was to really be this kind of ground up project where we wanted to really uplift underserved communities through um, literary engagement. We could, we didn't figure out how to do that for a long time. And the way we finally started to figure out how to do it was once we started designing the West Side Riverway Park and created this partnership with the West Side Legends um, we then were able to talk about and plan programming um, directly with West Side residents and to actually hold that programming in the West Side. So um, we have kind of transitioned our, uh, our concept of where Mastheads events should happen. Um, to public open spaces in the west side. So um, our most successful event last year was in Durant Park. In partnership with the West Side Legends, we had Frances Jones Sneed, who's a retired professor from MCLA and who spent her career doing essentially new research about the black, about black history of the Berkshires, do a talk in Durant Park 
Um, and the West Side Legends were responsible for the marketing of the event and we co-planned it with them. And we really just provided the, we helped provide the speaker and the space to do that. Um, but we now have kind of gotten to this exciting place where it feels like the mastheads can actually be used as a way to generate new research and new information that loops underrepresented groups into the concept of what Pittsfield's literary heritage even is. So something I just find so amazing is that the West Side has just historically always been the the African American hub of Pittsfield and there are people who live there to this day who are descendants of um, veterans of the Mass 54th Regiment, are descendants of Samuel L. Harrison, who was the, um, the minister of the Second Congregational Church who led the Mass 54th. Um, there are descendants of W.B. Du Bois. There are descendants of the Harlem Renaissance photographer, James Van Der Zee. These stories are still exist kind of in these family oral histories in this neighborhood and many of them are not written down anywhere so something that i think we're really energized to do now and to try to start doing fairly quickly is we've started doing a series of elder videos and elder interviews to nice. try to draw out um a lot of these kind of underlying stories about immigration um, different ethnic groups coming to Pittsfield by way of the West Side. Um, and actually starting next year, we're starting a um, Latinx literary outreach program through the masthead. So it's kind of transitioned in some ways to initially being about celebrating kind of the most known uh, history of Pittsfield writers. And it's transitioned into developing, uncovering, researching, and producing information that's not yet out there about the story of Pittsfield. Very cool. Yeah. That's, that's that's a, thank you so much. I can't believe we're at time already because this has just been captivating. Um, but I, I do hope you all will continue to follow Tessa's um, progress at the Red Lion Inn. Uh, we are in talks about doing a, a kind of final wrap up um, artist talk and display of work. Um, so that will certainly be on our website and announced. So I hope you'll engage in that. And this series is a part of a larger artist talk series. Um, coming up later this month and through September is the Berkshire Pottery Tour series. So we have several Berkshire potters who will be presenting about their work. So I hope you'll join for that and continue to be engaged and have a wonderful rest of your night. Thank you Hello, all. friends and family. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks so much, Lucy. This was really fun. <laughs>